Um, so without any further delay, I'd love to introduce our speaker tonight, um, Dr. Colin Mendelson, who's the GP and the founding chairman of the Australian Tobacco Harm Reduction Association. Um, Colin's been a GP in Sydney for 27 years and has a special interest in smoking cessation. And he now works exclusively in tobacco treatment, helping smokers to quit. He's a member of the committee that develops the RACGP National Smoking Guidelines that I was mentioning before. Um, and he's actually actively involved in research, writing and teaching about smoking cessation, tobacco harm reduction, tobacco control. Um, it's really fantastic to have him here tonight. Often um, when we hear from someone at a webinar, they're either a clinician or they're a research researcher or expert and Collins all of the above. So he knows what it's like to, to actually actually work in clinical practice, but at the same time, you know, he knows a lot about um, research and um, what works and what doesn't. So thanks, Colin, over to you. Thanks, Nicole. So let me get my screen slides up on the screen. It's hopefully will, oops, no, not that, okay, sorry. We're gonna to have to do this properly. I have to now share the screen and pick those slides and share. Okay, we're on that. Uh, is that working? I, I can see it. You can see, see the presentation? Uh, I can. Yeah, yes. that's good, Alan. Okay, we're in business. Okay, so um, moving on. Look, so basically, thank you very much for asking me um, to uh, participate tonight. Um, this is a really important new area and clinicians will need to know about this whole issue of vaping, um, certainly from the 1st of October. And my talk tonight is all about the evidence for vaping, uh, how to actually go about counselling smokers on vaping in, in clinical practice. Uh, how to write a nicotine prescription and, and what are the new regulations and how do they apply in the general practice setting. I just wanted to remind you that smoking is still a major problem, as we all know. We often think we've actually dealt with it, but in fact, we actually haven't. And one in seven Australian adults still smokes. And as Nick said, it's the leading cause of preventable cause of death, killing 21,000 Australians each year prematurely. And two out of every three smokers will die from their smoking. So it's a huge problem in general practice. The problem we have though, as you all know, is that the current therapies have very low success rates. So even with the best treatments, uh, 85 to 95% of uh, uh, treatment, uh, treatments will fail. And, and at six months will no longer be working. And the relapse rate after that continues to, to rise. So it's still a big problem. And many people go through this cycle repeatedly. And that's where this new option of harm reduction comes in. Uh, vaping has a role in these smokers who've tried repeatedly to quit and haven't been able to. So vaping involves using a device like this, uh, which consists of a battery, uh, a heating coil, a chamber which contains uh, nicotine liquid. And when the vapor breathes in, the heating coil heats up, vaporizes the liquid into an aerosol which they inhale. So it very much simulates the smoking experience and they exhale a visible mist, again, which looks like smoke. And what vaping does is it simulate smoking by giving you the addiction that a smoker is addicted to or dependent on, and it replicates the whole smoking ritual. So the hand-to-mouth ritual, the, the tastes and sensations of smoking, the, the, the uh, social aspects of smoking. So when someone switches to vaping, they're actually giving up much less than they do when they have to actually quit completely. So it's a form of nicotine replacement therapy combined with uh, behavioral, behavioral uh, uh, mimicking ritual. So this is a form of tobacco harm reduction. It's one form. And the focus of tobacco harm reduction is to reduce the harm in people who are going to be smoking anyway. So for smokers who can't quit, they're going to continue to smoke. Our aim is to try and at least prevent or reduce 
uh, we can't eliminate, but reduce the risk from, from uh, nicotine, the nicotine product that they're using. So tobacco harm reduction is all about switching them from a high risk nicotine product to a low risk nicotine product. So they get the nicotine without the harm because almost all the harm from smoking uh, is caused by burning tobacco. The 7,000 chemicals that result from that. And that's what we need to get rid of. So in vaping, there is no tobacco, there's no combustion, nothing burns uh, and there's no smoke. And that's why it's, it's so much safer, safer. It's as simple as that. And it's no different to using methadone for heroin users. So we have to accept some people will uh, follow risky behaviours, which they can't stop. But our job is at least to try and reduce the harm that those risky behaviours are doing. And <clears throat> methadone for heroin and nicotine vaping for smokers is really no different. <coughs> Excuse me. Nicotine products fall on a continuum of risk. And as you can see from this graph, on the right-hand end, you've got the combustible products which cause most of the harm. So cigarettes, cigars, tobacco burn and release all the toxins. But what we want to do is move those smokers down to the other end of the table where you've got the nicotine replacement products and the e-cigarettes. So the aim is to switch them down from a high-risk product to a low risk nicotine alternative. And ideally they'll then move on to complete abstinence from nicotine, but our, our goal certainly initially is to reduce the, the risk to health. So that's what harm reduction does. And it's supported by the College of GPs who say it's reasonable to recommend this when people have tried other treatments and failed, uh, when they're still motivated to quit and if they ask their doctor about it. So it's not a replacement for other treatments, it's a supplement. If you've tried all the other treatments and they haven't worked and the patient's gonna to continue to smoke, you know two out of three of them will die from their smoking. Well, that's when this second line treatment has a role. And I think you'll find that just about all of your smokers have actually gone through that process of repeated attempts to, fail, to, to quit and have failed. So, is vaping effective? Let's have a look at that. Uh, I'd like to introduce Lindsay, um, who's a, a vapor from Western Australia, who's going to tell his story. So let's listen to Lindsay. G'day, uh, my name's Lindsay. I live in Western Australia and uh, I was a smoker for 30 odd years. I was diagnosed with COPD nine years ago. Um, it's prompted me to try and give up and I failed dismally failed, just uh, nothing worked. The uh, NRT and the, the Zyban and the Shampix didn't work. Um, too easy to go and purchase tobacco down the street and uh, kill myself with it, not a problem, just go and buy it. So more recently I was diagnosed with emphysema and um, with the complications that go with COPD, um, bronchitis, uh, COPD, emphysema, uh, really bad. Uh, looking at oxygen, the doctor was looking at oxygen and was pumping me full of cortisone injections as well as my normal medication. Uh, basically, I was in dire straits. So I, I tried the e-cigarette. So I had a bit of trouble to start with. I, 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 this is what I started with. Um, it worked, it worked, but it made me cough like mad. So I had to do, uh, go online. There's a whole pile of forums out there, lots and lots of information. Uh, uh, changed the juices a little bit and away we went, no worries at all. It worked. Uh, battery life was the main concern with this one. I would run out and uh, need more batteries. So I upgraded to a, lar um, to a different device with a larger battery. Um, I still ran out of battery in it. The, this device blew me away. Um, the other one was good. This one was fantastic, uh, totally. No cravings at all for cigarettes, no, none at all. Um, I upgraded to a two battery device. This one's got a battery on either side of the device and um, they're large uh, batteries. <clears throat> a little bit of uh, safety needed for the batteries, but um, online um, you can find it all the information you need. These batteries, they talk about them exploding. Well, guess what? <clears throat> the same type of battery in this device I'm recording on now, um, a tablet. Not a problem. Those uh, lithium ion batteries are in there, they're different form, but they're the same. They're in cameras, they're in phones, they're in all sorts of devices. 
If you don't look after them, they can go bang. Okay, so do your research and make sure you, that you, you understand what that's about. Though you use them every day now, so uh, be careful. Anyway, so they work great, fantastic devices. Um, the emphysema was out of control. It's gone basically. That's not true. I still have it. I can't get rid of it. I've done the damage with smoking. Um, it's irreversible. But basically, my lung function has uh, come back quite a lot. Um, I'm able to walk around. I feel fantastic. Um, no worries. Really amazed. Um, cigarettes, poor. Man, they stink. I don't know how I ever smoked in, in the past. I don't know how I did it for 30 odd years. I just don't get it. I don't smell like I thought they'd smell, which is interesting. Surprising. But they really smell. So I don't see me going back to smokes any old time. I don't even want a cigarette. I don't think about them. I don't want one. This is the uh, device for me. Um, you can uh, reduce your nicotine and get off it. Now, uh, the nicotine, okay, they tell us it's illegal to, to purchase nicotine in Western Australia, uh, the uh, juices. Not so. Get a prescription, have it dispensed by a chemist. Perfectly legal, 100% legal. So don't think you're doing anything wrong or being naughty or whatever and that you shouldn't do it because, you know, it's not really allowed. I hate doing that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's not illegal. So um, yeah, look, that's a, a case a case study. Uh, 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 Lindsay has been very successful with quitting. Uh, what does the research say though? There's a lot of research now on on whether nicotine uh, nicotine vaping works, and we know from the studies that have been done that it's more effective than nicotine replacement. And the Cochrane review, a number of other reviews, one done by the College of Method Analysis recently, have found that it's at least seventy percent more effective in randomized controlled trials and that's in an artificial controlled environment but in the real world uh, the studies have supported that kind of outcome um, there have been observational studies uh, large studies in big populations uh, changes in smoking rates in populations where there are, is uh, much more use of nicotine vaping uh, have much higher Quit rates than populations which don't. Um, and there's a lot of people who, who vape now. There's actually about 70 million vapors in the world. So all of this information supports um, the effectiveness of vaping. Each type of evidence on its own has, has problems uh, in terms of biases and, and methodological issues, but altogether it, um, it, it actually comes together to support vaping uh, quite consistently. The other very important issue for vaping is the huge financial savings. Vaping's about 90% cheaper. And for people like Lindsay and people who are on low incomes, that's a huge, huge saving. So the average 20 a day smoker will spend about 12,500 a year. Um, a vapor might spend $1,000 a year, depending on what they vape. So that's really important for this population. I wanted to ask a few questions about nicotine, and this is where I'd like uh, the poll to appear because I want you to answer these questions to find out what you, your understanding of nicotine is. And I'm hoping the poll will appear any minute. Uh, maybe it's already there, I can't tell. Pat, I don't think we can see the... Um... The poll. Hmm. Okay, well, if you could just have a think about those questions. Oh, there's the, there's the poll. Okay. Um, but think about those questions. What are you, what's your understanding of what nicotine actually does? Uh, and look, I'll, I'll move on to the answers. I'm not sure how far we are with the poll. Um, but uh, Nick, are you going to read the poll results out or? Yeah, Pat, it's disappeared again. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So we just well, give it a give it a minute for people to okay, sure. answer. And Pat, when you think that enough people have answered, just um, close the poll and pop the answers up, please. Well, let, let's the move answers, on. The answers are just coming through now. We've only got thirty two percent completed, so we'll just give them a moment. Okay. 
Okay. So, look, I might just make some comments about this. I think the first thing is that nicotine is not a harmful ingredient in tobacco. And um, this quote, for example, by Public Health England says that nicotine itself represents minimal risk of harm to health. And its addictiveness depends on how you administer it. In smoking, it's very addictive. In nicotine replacement, it's extremely low uh, in terms of addiction. Leading health authorities have told us that nicotine does not cause cancer. It doesn't cause lung disease, and it only has a minor role in cardiovascular disease. And you can see from the, the surveys that there's a lot of misunderstanding about nicotine. It's not the nicotine that causes the problem. And that's why we're not so concerned about switching people over to long-term nicotine. What we're concerned about is all the other chemicals in tobacco. Yes, they're addicted to nicotine, but that's not what's going to kill them. The, the question about adult, adolescent brain development is often raised, but there's no evidence of harm from nicotine to the developing brain. The reports that we've seen uh, are all based on harm in rodents. And, and there's one thing that we're absolutely certain about, and that is that adolescent rodents should not vape because there is good evidence that um, nicotine is harmful to them, but no evidence for humans. So um, that's an important take home message. Uh, in general, is vaping safer than smoking? Well, it's substantially safer. And that's based on the fact that the chemicals in vapor are far less than they are in smoke and, and in much lower concentration. So in cigarette smoke, there's over 7,000 chemicals. In the vapor from an e-cigarette, less than 100, quite a lot less in, in many cases. And those that are there, uh, most of them are the smoking toxins are not present. Those that are there are mostly less than 1% of what they are in smoke. So that gives you an idea of why Public Health England and the Royal College of Physicians say that vaping is at least 95% safer than smoking. And that's based on the dramatic reduction in toxins, the fact that the toxins in the body of vapors are much less than they are in smokers. Uh, Various health conditions improve when people switch from smoking to vaping. Asthma improves, improves blood pressure improves, cardiovascular risk reduces, COPD improves. And there's no evidence of harm from secondhand vapor. So of all the studies that have been done, there's no evidence of, of, of actual harm from secondhand vapor. There's lots of good reasons for that, which we can discuss in, in the questions. But what about long-term risk? Well, what's gonna happen in 30 years time? Well, we don't know what's gonna happen in 30 years time with any new product. That's, I think, the key message here. We just don't know with anything, but the Royal College of Physicians, based on what we do know, and we know a lot, says that the long-term risk of vaping is likely to be no more than 5% of the risk of smoking. There may be uh, potential harms we don't know about that appear, but, uh, uh, it's, it, and that's possible, and we need to monitor long-term use. Just a quick word on this lung condition that developed in North America in 2019, which killed some people from vaping. It was nothing to do with nicotine vaping. That's the, the, the important message. You may have heard vaping damages your lungs. Actually, this was all about contaminated THC vaping. So please understand that that's not a concern for the, what we're talking about tonight. So the condition that if I leave. I'm going to show you a video by leading experts from the UK about safety, just to reinforce what I've said. Using e-cigarettes does differ from tobacco in a very clear way, which is that it doesn't involve inhaling tobacco smoke. And as the constituents of smoke are the things that kill smokers, that has to be a good thing. People die from the uh, tar, the other constituents of smoke, but not the nicotine. So the nicotine isn't the harmful component. And electronic cigarettes allow smokers to get the nicotine without all the other harmful stuff that comes along in cigarette smoke. The first thing to note when considering the safety of e-cigarettes is that the vast majority of e-cigarette users are people who are either still smoking and using them to cut down on the amount they smoke, 
or have used them to stop smoking. If we try to put a figure on the relative risk of electronic cigarettes and compared with smoking, my view is that it's going to be well under 5% of the risk, possibly slightly more for cardiovascular disease, but substantially less for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and lung cancer. When you look at the concentrations of and the nature of the toxins in cigarette smoke, and then you compare that with e-cigarettes, you see that really there's, there's no comparison. Most of the toxins in cigarette smoke aren't present at all in e-cigarette vapour. Uh, those that are present are in present in concentrations that are a hundred times less or more. Some people say that uh, the advent of electronic cigarettes is renormalizing tobacco smoking. So we see people using these devices and it's making smoking more normal again. Interestingly, we're just not seeing that in the data we have. All that it does is normalize electronic cigarette use. And if we could normalize electronic cigarette use for the nearly 9 million people in the United Kingdom who are still addicted to tobacco, that could only be a good thing. I think it's really important that uh, people be reassured that e-cigarettes, whatever you might see in the press, are considerably safer than smoking and uh, the evidence is pretty good that they can be effective in helping people to stop. Yes, I think the bottom line from all that is that Vaping is not risk-free. Yes, there are uh, risks, There's, there are small risks, but it's far safer than smoking. So for a smoker who can't quit, it's clearly uh, a choice that should be considered. Let's talk about the vaping devices. And the only problem here is that there are many. And I'm going to introduce you four of the main categories and um, that are most useful for beginners. And the simplest one is the disposables. So for many people, using a disposable is a simple replacement for tobacco smoking. It involves, it's an it's a easy to use device. It involves no maintenance. There's no buttons or charging involved. You use it till it's empty and you throw it away. It does create environmental issues, but it's very easy as a transition model from a cigarette. You just put it in your mouth and you draw like you do with a cigarette. So that's disposables, and there are some very good ones available. Um, probably the most popular type of model is what we call the pre-filled pod models. So these consist of a, a replaceable sealed pod, these little devices on the right of the screen, which have the nicotine sealed and pre-filled. And you attach those to the top of the rechargeable battery, in this case, that red object. Um, these are also very easy to use. So there's no buttons, there's no maintenance, there's no replacement of parts. When the cartridge or the pod runs out, you put a new one on and keep, keep vaping. And roughly one pod is equivalent to about a pack of cigarettes to give, give you an idea. So they're the pre-filled uh, pod devices. Now there's another kind of pod device. These are the ones with a pod that you actually keep refilling. So this one has a pod at the top, which you can take off and you purchase nicotine separately and add it to the pod. And it's cheaper that way because you're not buying the pod every time, you're simply filling it from a bottle. So you've got that little pod which slips into the battery compartment and you just take it out and refill it as needed. It's a little bit more fiddly, but it is cheaper and it's also very popular. And the other beginner model is what we call the vape pen, which is a built a bit like a pen. So you can see with this model, you basically fill it up with nicotine as, as, as needed, but you do have to replace the heating coil that burns out every two, three, four weeks. So that's a little bit fiddly. Um, it's got a much larger, uh, battery, a rechargeable battery, which you plug in through a USB cord. Uh, it's a bit more fiddly, but it's more satisfying for many smokers. Now, to keep things simple, what I'd suggest is that you learn about one or two models of each type. And I've suggested here are the ones that I personally tend to use. So for a disposable, I use the Allo because it's it's been 
tested, uh, the emissions have been tested, we know it's a quality product. There are very low levels of toxins. It's very reasonably priced, comes from New Zealand. Um, Wild by Instinct is another excellent pre-filled pod device. You buy the pod separately. It's not expensive, uh, very high quality product. They've tested the emissions. We know what's going into the smoker, the vapor in this case. Uh, and that's a product I use regularly. And for refillable pod models, the most popular one is what's called the Caliburn. And again, you take that pod off and fill it up yourself. And the same with the pen vapes, this Endura, Inokin Endura T182 is, is, is a very popular model, very reliable, been around for many years in a different form, but a nice simple pen device. So if you just want to keep it simple, you can you can order or just work with you know one one or two products for each kind of uh, device, and that's probably the best way to go. Well, what about nicotine liquids? So the nicotine liquids consist of nicotine, which is optional, uh, flavorings, which are optional, but they all contain propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin, which is the carrier for the other ingredients, and they what make the vapor. So there are four ingredients. Now, when you heat them, they do break down into some of the other chemicals, but in the liquid, there's only the four ingredients. Something to be aware of is that some people buy their products pre-mixed. So they've got the nicotine, the flavoring, the PG and the VG all together, already ready to go, ready to vape. So they're pre-mixed and that's what most beginners use. They don't wanna be fiddling around with mixing. They just buy it as it is, different sizes and flavors and away they go. Some more experienced uh, vapors, in, in my experience about one in four vapors use, make their own liquid. So they buy the nicotine separately in high concentration, 100 milligram per mil, and they'll add it to their own flavoring, their own PG and VG. And their little kits they can buy to mix it together. They use recipes. And for many people, it's quite a fun hobby. Uh, and they can make it just as they want it. And it's of course much cheaper than buying it pre-made. So people might ask you for pre-mixed nicotine, 12 milligrams per mil in strawberry, all made up ready to go. Or they might ask you for the straight nicotine and they will add that to the other ingredients. Just to confuse things a little bit further, there are two kinds of nicotine. I don't want to say too much about them, but there's free base nicotine, which is used in high powered devices, such as the ones here at low concentrations. Because they're in the high powered devices, you don't want too much nicotine because these devices release a lot more nicotine. So you want a lower strength and the high powered device releases the required amount. The alternative is what's called nicotine salt. These are both forms of nicotine. These are used in low power devices with small batteries like the ones I've shown here, and they generally use higher levels of nicotine. So it's just something to be aware of. If someone's using a disposable like that yellow model, they'll need probably 60 or 50 to 60 milligrams per mil. Uh, and uh, in the larger, the more powerful devices, they'll use sometimes three or six milligrams per mil. So that's a, a difference just to be aware of. The next question is, how many vapors do you think there are in Australia? Um, based on the, on the 2019 National Drug Strategy Household Survey, what number do you think are likely to be in Australia now? Yeah, I think we often underestimate the number of vapors in Australia. The number is actually about 600,000, which is a lot. And it speaks to the fact that vaping is the most popular quitting method in the world and in Australia today. And according to our national survey, it is the most popular way to quit. Uh, and it's, it's spreading very fast in the community. The next thing I want to talk about is what do you tell smokers when they come in and, and ask about vaping? Oh, here's your, your answers show that, yes, generally people think there are fewer than that, but um, yes, the numbers are growing quite rapidly. Vaping is a little bit different to smoking. People need to know 
to breathe in for longer. With a cigarette, you puff for one or two seconds. With vaping, uh, three or four seconds. You need to let that hell of element heat up slowly. And as you breathe in, it heats. But when you stop breathing in, it stops heating. Um, I'll remove that poll. Um, you can tell people that they can have a vape break like they do when they smoke, so 10 or 12 puffs, or they can just graze through the day. And a lot of people just have a puff or two or three as needed through the day at regular intervals. And they, they rarely have too much. They just have as much as they need to maintain those, uh, to fill those receptors. So they can have it as needed and make sure they have as much as they want. Ha make sure that they get enough of a con the concentration, have enough puffs and use a device which delivers enough nicotine for them. You can combine vaping with the patch and it, it does increase success rates for people who need that background level of nicotine. But I think the really important message for vapors is you've got to persevere until you find the right device flavor and strength of nicotine that works for you. People say, often say, look, I tried this and like Lindsay, that just didn't hit the spot or it wasn't until I found that device and that strength, that was it, that was perfect. So people need to be persistent. So don't, don't let people give up. And we say to people they should stop when they're ready. I mean, ideally they'll stop as soon as possible, but there's no time frame for that. When they're ready, they'll stop. And then they should try and stop vaping if they can. Generally, we say within three to six months. But if they have to continue smoke, vaping, that's much better than smoking. Uh, and if it's preventing them from relapsing, then we have no problem with that. What we're concerned about is smoke. Uh, and if they have to continue with nicotine long term, that's not, not a, a significant problem. Uh, we don't want them smoking and vaping. And there are some safety rules about charging and keeping nicotine out of the reach of children. So how do you prescribe nicotine? So this, this is the business end of the, of the uh, um, uh, presentation. It isn't a, a criminal offence to import or possess nicotine without a prescription. That applies now. But it is legal with a prescription. Uh, and people, patients can import nicotine legally from overseas under the TGA Personal Importation Scheme. From the 1st of October, they can purchase nicotine from participating Australian pharmacies if the doctor is an authorised prescriber. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But looking at the Personal Importation Scheme, people can bring in what they need. The prescriptions are for periods up to 15 months. Uh, each supply is up to three months use for that patient and the doctor and patient will work it out together and you can give up to three repeats so that that covers at least 12 months and you're allowed to sort of stretch that to 15 months. So if someone wants to order nicotine and bring it into Australia, they can have a script for up to, up to 15 months, uh, normally with three months supply and three repeats. They need to send a copy to the overseas retailer who sends it back. So if it's intercepted at, uh, by the border force, it, it is allowed to, to, to pass through. Otherwise there are holdups and a potential fine. They should keep your copy on their phone. Um, yeah, and, okay. And so let me just show you what the scripts look like. So the scripts need to say nicotine liquid for inhalation for smoking cessation. So if they're using pods like this, you might decide if they're using one pod a day, then they'll need 90 pods for three month supply. You might specify the size of the pod and the brand of the pod. And you might say, and you would need to say the nicotine strength. You don't have to give brands, the patient will order that online. You don't have to specify flavors. The patient just organizes that. Your job is to say they can have this much nicotine at this strength and this many repeats. So that's what you'd say on the prescription for pods. If someone says, look, I just want pre-mixed nicotine to put into my vape pen, you say the same thing, nicotine liquid for inhalation for smoking, smoking cessation, you give the strength, and that might be 12 milligram per mil, the constant or the volume that will last three months, in this case, say uh, 500 mils for someone who's using, say, five mils a day, this is about average, 
and three repeats, which will cover them for the year. So that's to give them the pre-mixed nicotine. And then there's the do-it-yourself users. Now, these users are more experienced. They like to mix their own liquids. And as I said, about 25 to 30% of my patients say that that's what they do. And they buy nicotine at 100 milligram per mil, which is the same as 10%. And that you can give them uh, as much as they need for a three month period. That may be a bottle of 100 milligram per mil. I usually write on there must be diluted before use because they can't vape 10% or 100 milligram per mil, but they might dilute it to 0.3% or 0.6%, which is three or six milligram per mil. So they might need 100 mils for three months and three repeats that will cover them for a year. Now you don't have to memorize this uh, table, but I'll put it in as a reference for later. So the question is what strength, if you've got a new vapor, uh, what strength of nicotine should you give them? That's the hard part. And this is a guide based on how addicted they are to nicotine and what device they're using. So as I mentioned, there are certain devices that produce a lot more nicotine than others. So cigar likes have very little batteries. They're just like a cigarette. They need higher, they need, they need higher doses of nicotine, but they, they only have doses up to 24 and they, they don't achieve high levels of nicotine for most people. Disposables, pre-filled pod vapes and the refillable pod vapes, um, or, uh, well, so let's go back a step. The disposables and the pre-filled pod vapes use nicotine salt at higher levels. The refillable pod vapes uh, use lower levels of nicotine salt or free base, and I know it's confusing. Um, and then there are different concentrations for the other types of devices. But that's a guide you can discuss with new, new smokers, and I'll, new vapors, and I'll leave that in, in, the, in the presentation. This is for what we call mouth to lung vaping, and you'll hear talk about mouth to lung and direct to lung vaping. So most beginners use what's called mouth to lung vaping, which is where they take the, the, the vapor into the mouth, pause for a moment, and then take it as a second breath into the lungs. So most people start that way because that's the way they smoke. If they're direct to lung vaping, uh, they uh, will we'll do it a little bit differently. And I, I won't cover that just now. For smokers who want to buy the nicotine from the pharmacy, there are some participating pharmacies that will now sell the nicotine. The doctor has to become an authorized prescriber. It's a very quick process on the TGA website, Streamline, and you can write as many scripts as you need to for five years. It's a private non-PBS subscription. And depending on what the pharmacy will, will provide, you can get commercial products. So the product the patient's using, the pharmacist may be able to get that from the wholesaler or compounding pharmacies may be able to make up a, a solution. 12% nicotine, or sorry, 12 milligram per mil, um, banana flavor, um, uh, well, you, you may want to talk about the amount of VG and PG. Um, usually it's 50-50. Um, and uh, you may want to specify um, uh, the flavor and whether it's a free base or nicotine salt, but that's going a little bit further on in, in what you need to know. So the bottom line is people can get nicotine within Australia if you're an approved prescriber and they can get commercial brands or they can have it made up. So where do people buy the products when they've got the script? Well, to buy the, the vaporizers, uh, the nicotine-free liquids, and all the accessories, they go to Aussie vape shops. Uh, there are 160 or 170 of these around Australia. This website I've given here uh, lists uh, most of the vape shops in Australia, so they can find the one in their area. If they want to buy nicotine, they can't buy that or they can buy that from the pharmacies, but they can also import it from overseas. These are some of the uh, better known websites in New Zealand uh, from which you can buy good quality uh, UPS or pharma, pharmacopoeial grade nicotine. Um, 
there's four listed there, there are lots of others. Uh, you can also buy nicotine from Australian pharmacies if you're an authorised prescriber. Anyone can write a script for importation, any doctor, but if you want the patient to buy the nicotine from a pharmacy, you have to be an authorised prescriber. Oops. Okay, so here we are at the end. So what I wanted to emphasise is that vaping is a second line treatment. So it's for people who have tried all the other treatments or have refused to try certain treatments, and often people do, they've heard stories, and are otherwise unable to quit. And it's, it's, it's a, an, an additional next step for those smokers, which we should consider trying. It's used by many people just as a short-term quitting aid. So they use vaping to quit smoking, then they quit vaping. Some people need to stay on it long-term, and that's long-term tobacco harm reduction. It's arguably the most effective quitting aid we have, uh, and it's certainly the most popular quitting aid in Australia and in uh, all other Western countries. It's not risk-free, but it's far safer than smoking. Exactly how much doesn't really matter. We know it's far safer than smoking. I suggest you learn about one or two of those, each of those beginner models uh, and get familiar with them like you do with other drugs. And, you know, it's not a big deal to become comfortable with one or two models of each type and learn where to get them and um, you can advise patients on their use. You can import nicotine from overseas or from a pharmacy, it can be purchased. And I think the bottom line is that long-term vaping is uh, far less harmful than relapsing to smoking. Um, as I said, we may find out there are issues in the long term, but it's beyond any reasonable doubt based on the, the toxicology that this is going to be a much safer alternative to smoking. Now, I've finished my presentation. Uh, I think Nick wants to say a few words. I'll leave the slide up just for the moment. Thanks, Colin. Look, we, we might just um, go straight to the questions because there's, there's stacks of them. Um, so I might just go straight into that and then I'll get to the um, study and the um, other stuff at the end. Um, so the first question was, um, absence of evidence is not ev evidence. Um, if absence, I think I think it's meant to say, absence of evidence is not evidence um, that of absence of harm. Yes. Um, so if there's evidence of harm, to the development of um, brains in rats, shouldn't we be concerned about um, vaping adolescents? Well, the, the reality is that uh, there have been many, many reviews that have looked at whether you can extrapolate from animal and cell studies to humans. And in general, uh, they, there is very poor correlation. Finding those findings in a, in a laboratory study is an indication that's something we need to look into. But the other argument is that there have been hundreds of millions of smokers uh, over the in the world uh, for many years. And down the tracks, sort of decades later, we're not seeing uh, evidence of brain damage in people who have smoked, uh, not to mention it's not just nicotine, that's all the other chemicals. There's no epidemiological data uh, that smoking itself causes harm. I mean, Einstein was a smoker when he was young and Freud and so many other very bright people. Uh, maybe they would have been smarter, but the, the, the evidence is, and there's lots of good ep the epidemiological studies, that there's no harm uh, to the adolescent brain in, in later life. Um, I think you've already discussed regulations, but someone's asked, is there any regulation on the liquid that is manufactured? Uh, it needs to be pharmacopoeia grade, so USP grade, mm -hmm. uh, United States pharmacopoeia, and uh, almost all of the, the reputable, the, the, all the reputable products from New Zealand are, are UPS. And that's required by one of the other changes that on the 31st of October is that there are minimum standards and um, uh, that, that those products, uh, the nicotine needs to be uh, pharmacopoeia or grades, so are very pure. Okay, all right. Um, another question, AMA position seems to be quite opposed to vaping mm -hmm. and to be used as a last resort and time limited. Um, is that still the position? Look, it's interesting, isn't it? The AMA has a very strong harm reduction approach to a range of other products uh, and, and drug, drug um, situations. So they, they are very much in favour of pill testing, heroin, um, methadone treatment and for heroin users and drug consumption rooms. But in regard to tobacco smoking, which is the biggest killer, they have 
concerns. What's interesting is that they're in direct opposition to the British Medical Association, the New Zealand Medical Association, the Royal College of Physicians, the Royal College of General Practitioners. I think there's a lot more than the evidence involved here. I think we have more than enough evidence. They're taking a very conservative, risk-averse view, which in my view is the wrong approach. Um, because while we're waiting for all this evidence in 30 years time, uh, people are dying. And uh, I think it's beyond reasonable doubt that this is an effective and a much safer alternative. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I see it very similar to, to prescribing methadone for someone with an opioid, um, you know, um, misuse problem, um, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay, next question. What proportion of smokers who switch to vaping to help quit, ultimately quit, versus remaining vaping long term? Uh, yeah, look, I don't know that. I think quite a few remain vaping long term. Um, they're the ones I tend to see more of. Um, there are certainly many smokers. We know in the UK there are at least a couple of million smokers who have switched to vaping and quit vaping altogether. Uh, I don't know what the proportions are. I don't know if that data is available. Okay. Are there any studies that show vaping use in young people increases tobacco use later in life? Well, that's a very good question. And, and I have got a slide uh, on that, which uh, my slides aren't still up now. I won't show you it now. But, the argument about youth vaping is that what, what there have been a number of studies that have shown that kids who vape are more likely to later on become smokers or to try smoking. Now, that doesn't prove that vaping has caused them to become smokers if they otherwise wouldn't have. So a much more plausible explanation is that these kids are risk takers. Kids who vape are also more likely to use illicit drugs, alcohol, um, to drink drive, uh, have unprotected sex and to smoke. And that doesn't mean that vaping has caused all those things. These are risk-taking kids. Mm. Um, and, and from the studies that have been done, these are cross-sectional studies. You can't prove that uh, vaping was the cause. And in fact, what we know from countries like the UK and the US where vaping is quite popular, smoking rates in young people have fallen faster than ever uh, while since, smoking, uh, since vaping became available. So that is not consistent with vaping being a gateway to smoking. In fact, it appears to be diverting young people from smoking. They'll try vaping, find it more enjoyable. Those that were going to smoke often don't go on to smoke. And many smokers, most, smoke, most kids who vape are already smokers in Australia and overseas. And many, many kids use vaping to stop smoking or as an alternative. Okay. That's interesting because anecdotally, I, I wouldn't have said that. Um, you know, I've got got teenage kids who thankfully don't vape, but you know they have friends, and um, there's you know frequent emails from the school saying that the toilets have been locked again during lunchtime because they're sick of them locking because the vapes are ending up in the toilets. So, yeah. um, and I suspect a lot of just from reading the questions, a lot of people are seeing seeing a similar thing with young people, and a lot of these kids. Um, aren't smokers um, and they're actually taking yeah. up vape, vaping because their friends are doing it. And um, Well, the yeah. fact is the research shows, and this is the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, less than 2% of kids in 2019 had vaped in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. That's once or twice or more. And most use is experimental and short-term. So kids try it. Those who are going to smoke anyway are the ones who are more likely to become regular vapors. And, and if anything, that's a good thing because they're not going on to smoking. Look, of course, kids shouldn't be doing either. But it's not, a, it's not rocket science that you, this is illegal. These kids are buying these illegally from tobacconists and other general stores. It needs to be enforced. I mean, why, why are they buying these products in the first place? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Where, where, where are they getting the money to buy them? Um, hmm. Next question. Is there any damage to, I think that's supposed to say, large bronchioles from the heat of the vapour? I'm not aware of any issue with the heat, no. I mean, the, 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 the cigarettes are heated to 900 degrees Celsius. Uh, vapors generally between 200 to 250. So in fact, if there is any heat damage, it would be less from vaping. Um, next question, what would, what would be limits on amount of nicotine to use? Amount of mils or milligrams of nicotine to use? You talked about five mils if you were using a 12 milligram per mil device, but is there a maximum level? 
look, it, it's whatever the patient needs. Uh, I, I don't limit the volume. I, I think people need to use as much as they need. And what's been shown is that people, when they switch from smoking to vaping, maintain their nicotine intake. Mm -hmm. So they regulate it. They sort of try trade and they extract what they need to maintain to fill those nicotine receptors. Mm -hmm. So the average volume in the new vapor is something like two to five mils a day. Mm -hmm. But in the pod devices, uh, which are uh, you know, these small devices, um, often it's just you know, one pod only in a day, and that's often just a mil. So it depends on the device. So it mm -hmm. might be one pod, or if they're using a one that they, they fill, it might be two, three, four, five mils a day. Okay. And the concentration varies from three to 60 milligrams per mil, depending on the type of device and how addictive they are. So the, the cheap ones that um, the kids buy, you know, for 20 bucks that last them, you know, a couple of weeks or whatever, that have mm. hundreds, hundreds of doses in it. Um, what, what sort of amount is that? Yeah, so they're generally 50 to 60 milligrams per mil, which gives you a hit the same as a cigarette. So what they found is the pharmacokinetics of those devices is pretty similar to smoking. You get a rapid rise of cigarette, of uh, nicotine, not quite to the level of smoking, but then it drops away in the same way. So it's no different to a cigarette, but that's what a lot of smokers need to be able to make the transition. You, they've got to get enough nicotine to be mm. able to... to um, uh, for, to be satisfied by the vape, to be able mm. to make the transition. So that's why it needs to be that strong. Mm. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. A bit, bit of an aside here, but sort of on the same topic. If, if, you've, got, if you've got a patient, I've got a 50-year-old um, a patient who had um, a large AMI a few years ago and he, he's overweight and he's unhealthy and he's got lots of stress mm. and he hasn't successfully been able to stop smoking and he's recently picked up one of these devices from a friend at work um, that he didn't have with him when he came in to see me and um, so he's using that and it has reduced it a little bit he's only just started using it is it worthwhile swapping him over to a another device I mean this this one that he's picked up from his friend is really cheap um, but obviously it's got flavored it's flavored you know it's a it's a stick of, of some sort um, is it is it worthwhile having a discussion in terms of you know yeah it, it's, a, it's a disposable is it it's a disposable yeah yeah so the ones the kids are buying are mostly two brands HQD and I get the problem with those is that they're brought in from China they're not regulated there's no uh, regulation of the nicotine or the, um, the, the liquid. Whereas the ones from New Zealand are generally very well made and regulated and tested. So I generally uh, switch people across to one or two of my favorite disposables. Uh, that There's one called Dinner Lady and one called Allo that I know are well made and properly tested. So I'll generally transfer people to those, give them a script and they can order those from New Zealand. Mm, okay, all right. Someone else has made the comment that sticks are most commonly used by youth. Is there a safety profile similar similar to nicotine pens? And I guess you've answered that by saying that they're not regulated and they're not regulated. We don't know. We really don't know, and they're not that well made. Some of them. So I generally. But having said that, I've seen quite a few patients, adult patients, who have quit with these cheap um, devices from tobacconists. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and that's been a great success. Then they've come to me and I've switched them to something a bit more reliable. Mm -hmm. But they've been available and they've been used as a quitting aid, which you know, is a huge thing for people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another nice question. Do the companies which produce these products also produce tobacco smoking products, i.e. big tobacco? <laughs> if you believe the newspapers, they do. The reality is that they don't. So there's not one products sold in Australia made by Big Tobacco. Um, about 20% of the world market is uh, controlled by Big Tobacco. So vaping products were made by, by, by non-Big, by, by non not by, made by Big Tobacco. And they got into vaping from about 2012 because they had to catch up. This was taking away all their customers and their share prices have fallen dramatically. And so they're trying to get into vaping as a way of maintaining their income. Mm -hmm. But as far as I'm concerned, the priority is to improve people's health. And if big tobacco switches from being a combustible nicotine um, product maker to a safer alternative, uh, I think that's a good thing. I'd much rather they were making vapes 
than making big than making cigarettes. But I don't recommend their products, having said that. But they are, only play a very small role in, in, in vaping, actually. Okay. Um, just clarifying about prescribing. Um, so anyone can prescribe for importation, but you still have to fill out either a special access or an authorised prescriber, yep. correct? Yeah. Yes, yeah. To be, to, to, for the pharmacy purchase, yeah. And, and just to clarify too, you can do one of two things, either become an authorised prescriber, which means you can write X mm. number of prescriptions, yeah. or you can yeah. use a special access scheme like you would with medicinal cannabis yeah. or methadone or um, suboxone, same kind of thing. Yes, but I, I asked John Skerritt this from the, the TGA at a webinar last week. I said, why would you bother using the SAS? It's much more complicated. And he said, well, you wouldn't but we just include it because it's there. So yeah. for most GPs, you just become an authorised prescriber. It's a streamlined, very quick process. Then you just write as many as you need to. You don't have to apply each time. Okay. All right. um, what's the recommended go for vaping device for first-time user? First-time user? Well, I'd normally offer them either a disposable or a pre-filled pod. So now the pre-filled pod, this is... Um, a wild and it's got a separate pod. They just buy the pods. This is 20 bucks. This is about $7. And they put it in, clicks in um, magnetically. And then when it runs out, they throw it away and put a new one on. So that's really easy. Or they can use a, I haven't got one just here, but a disposable, which they just suck. And, and when it's finished, they throw the whole thing away. Uh, and I, I mentioned my, my favorite, the ones I recommend mostly in that one of those slides. So. I think you just need to learn about one or two of each of those two types really and you'll cover most beginners. But most people will come in and say, look, I use this device, I want this much nicotine, I use this concentration and, and it's going to be easy. You just need to know what to put on the script. Um, another question, isn't the oil delivery vehicle that's being inhaled causing inflammatory lung reaction whilst being inhaled by vape? By it's, vape? Not, it's not oil, it's water soluble. Okay. It's not oil. So there were big reports of lipoid pneumonia. It doesn't cause lipoid pneumonia because it's not an oil. And yes, it does cause some inflammation. There's no question about that. It does cause some irritation, inflammation in the lungs. Um, there, it affects the immune cells. And look, that's not, that's not ideal. And in kids, it's been shown to increase asthma, to increase cough uh, and sputum. Uh, but it's not for non-smokers. It, it's all about reducing the harm in the smoker. So yes, it does cause some inflammation, but people, people who have asthma and health lung problems are much better off when they switch to vaping. Mm -hmm. um, someone's asked about the risk of nicotine overdose or accidental poisoning. Um, I, I, I've had one patient who's actually gotten quite nauseated from using, um, using a commercially bought vape. And I'm wondering yeah. if, that's, if that's a common thing or... Well, look, I, I don't know. I don't see the kids, but um, it's no different to cigarettes. I mean, in that if you have too much, you'll get too much nicotine and you'll get nauseous. And the worst that happens to kids from using overusing a vape is that they get nauseous mm. and then they stop. Mm. I mean, that, that's all. Basically, they get nauseous, they might vomit. And that's the sign that you've had too much nicotine. Mm. Mm. In terms of poisoning, there have been five children that I know of that have died globally in the last 15 years from nicotine mm -hmm. over accidental overdose. We had one in Melbourne. There was one in Korea, one in the UK, US, but it's actually very rare because almost always what happens is if you drink nicotine, uh, you vomit. And uh, actual death is actually very rare, surprisingly. It's certainly toxic in concentrate high concentrations but, and you need to be very careful around children mm -hmm. um someone's just asked if you if you declared any conflict of interest i think that was on your first slide that you had no conflicts yeah no i have i have never paid been paid by tobacco or e-cigarette companies and uh i do all of this work uh, in my own time quite independently of and there's no i don't have any interest in any companies or get any benefit from any companies okay yeah um, okay, prescribing. Will doses 
and recommendations being the therapeutic guidelines and ability to prescribe on standard electronic prescription software rather than handwritten. I mean, I, yeah. I assume, assume you ha you'd have to put it into a custom box if you're, if you're doing it on your computer. Well, not necessarily. So, so some of the commercial products are now listed in, they will be listed in Medical Director in um, best, best practice from the 1st of October. Um, I know there are a couple of brands at least that will be there and I'm sure others will follow. And if you want to prescribe something that's not there, then you need to make a, a recipe or, or, or and, and Medical Director is also looking into it as well. Uh, I'm not sure what they've done yet, but I've, I've actually approached both of them and I know best Medical practice has a couple in there already. Do you know off the top of your head what what um, brand names they are? Because yeah, I mean, the reality is we'll probably all, all only learn a couple of them, and you know, just to have yeah. them on hand. Well, well, the one um, the one of the ones that I use, which is Wild, is in in best practice or will be in best practice from first of October. Yeah, uh, and it has the different strengths and flavors. And there's another one called something like Saba. It's a German brand. Uh, they're also there. There may be others now, but they're the two I know of. All right, no, that's great. Um, yeah, no, just clar clarifying for personal importation, any GP can write a script for nicotine. Yep. Yep. Um, are there any vapes that don't contain nicotine? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, you can get nicotine free liquid from the vape shops in Australia. So you can buy your vape and put in nicotine free liquid. And, you know, with, uh, for example, with Wild, with Wild, they have. They have um, five, five, uh, 50 milligram pods, uh, three milligram pods and zero milligram pods. So the idea is you, you gradually reduce to zero and then you, you quit vaping altogether. So mm -hmm. yeah, you can, they, they also have a range of no nicotine uh, vapes, but um, you can buy bottles of nicotine free liquid and put those into devices as well. Mm. Okay, all right, mm. great. Um, okay, I think we've gotten through all of them. I'll have a look through later and if there are any more that need answering, I'll send through to you, Colin, yeah. um, another time. So we'll just, um, shall I just go back to sharing my last yeah. couple of slides? Mm -hmm. um, okay, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so you know, you, you, the University of New South Wales has a quit smoking study um, and it involves the use of nicotine replacement therapy and they, um, you can enrol your patients and um, they send out eight week supply of either nicotine gum or lozenges or e-cigarettes at no cost to the patient and then they follow them up at, um, at six months time. Um, they provide, you know, support, um, tech support, um, and they're the details there. They'll also be on, on the slides, but if you want to take a screenshot of that now. Um, I might just say too, Nick, that they provide a pod device and they provide uh, an Inokin Endura, which is one of the pen style devices and, and liquid to go with each. And people then decide which product they prefer. So it gives them a choice. Oh, that's great. Are you, are you involved in the study or? Yeah, I'm an investigator in that study, yeah. Yeah, okay, great. And last but not least, um, QR code for the um, link for um, your evaluation. If not, it'll be emailed out for you tomorrow. Um, thank you, Colin. That was a really great talk. Um, and um, I think it's going to start a few of us on our journey of prescribing um, nicotine now um, to try and get some of our long-term smokers off of cigarettes. Yeah. So thank you. It was really helpful. Welcome. Good. Okay. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a good night. Bye. Ah.